Welcome everyone. My name is Blake and I will be your moderator. Today we're joined by Dr. Tom Snyder and Dr. Ashley for advice on selling your practice. Before we get started, I'd like to note that Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I will pass it over to you now. Hello, my name is Tom Snyder and I'm Senior Director of Henry Schein Dental Practice Transitions. I've been advising dentists for over 35 years in matters related to practice transitions. Our division is one of the largest practice transition firms in the United States. And we've been involved uh, with numerous DSOs, both on the buy and sell side for a number of years. Now I'd like to introduce uh, the other members of our panel. Scott? Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, this is Scott Crow. I am an attorney with the law firm of Dickinson Wright, which is an international law firm with offices scattered throughout North America. Uh, I am a partner in the law firm and also an M&A attorney within the law firm with a focus on regulated businesses such as uh, dental practices. And I've been practicing in the space, buying and selling uh, practices and representing both both sellers and buyers and PE, private equity groups uh, for close to 20 years now. Mike. And this is... Yeah, no thanks. This is Mike White. Uh, I'm a principal at CLA, Cliff and Martin Allen. We're a nationally, uh, now global firm. Uh, I'm one of the national dental physician leaders, uh, serving the dental physician community from everything from outsourced accounting, consulting, CFO strategy to similar to Scott. Uh, work a lot in the M&A space and on both the buy and sell side. We pretty much split that evenly. Um, you know, our biggest thing is helping dental practices on the evolution of their practice. And we'll get around, get into a little bit of that today. Great. Well, thank you. Well, I know our audience is probably pretty diverse. There may be some of you who are in solo practice thinking about joining a DSO. I'm sure there's a good number of you who've already taken the plunge and you own multiple locations. There are some who have even bigger ideas to go to the next level and perhaps be acquired. But wherever you are, there's lots of information that we're going to share with you tonight that can help each and every one of you to get where you want to go. So let's talk a little bit about today's industry. As it relates to DSOs, uh, this has come from DSO Data Connect as of March 20, uh, 22nd, 2022, and it states that they have looked at the industry and they've come up with almost 2,100 uh, DSOs identified as of that time. Uh, there are 59 of them that are what we call elite, DSOs, and there's about uh, 59 of them, and they have 75 plus locations. There's another number that we call mid market, 360 of them, where we vary between uh, 10 to 74 locations. And the majority of the audience, probably, that we're speaking to tonight is in that third category, what we call emerging groups. There's almost 1,900 of you who are in that category. So there's lots of things that need to be considered, especially if you want to get to the second or the third level. And I think tonight we'll be able to share with you some really good insights. Uh, the marketplace has changed. Uh, since I graduated from dental school many years ago, uh, most of my classmates were solo practitioners. Well, as most of you know, that's not the case today. Matter of fact, in 2021, according to the ADA's health Policy Institute, only 46% of dentists were considered solo practitioners. And that ratio has decreased since 2021 when there were 67%. So there's no question that our profession has been changing and will continue to change. As a matter of fact, in 2019, only one in four dentists under the age of 35 wanted to be in solo practice. So obviously, most of our younger dentists today desire, desire to work with another dentist or in some type of a corporate setting. Also, no, no matter whether you're an elite practice or a DSO, I should say, or you're an emerging DSO, one of the big challenges we're facing in the profession is staffing shortages. And it's really a problem. 30 to 35% of practices all across the board are having problems recruiting uh, hygienists and dental assistants. And unfortunately, that particular problem is not going to go away, but it's something I'm sure that some of you now are facing. And another thing that's really kind of pushing the tide towards more groups is the fact that practice ownership has been declining. 
In 2005, about 85% of uh, folks in private practice uh, owned a practice. Uh, now that number is down to 73%. As a matter of fact, we see more younger dentists who are willing to work uh, for someone else. As a matter of fact, 2019, 10.4% of dentists were affiliated with DSOs. That's the most recent information we can get from the ADA's Health Policy Institute, but I'd venture a guess to say that number has risen dramatically. A lot more folks are affiliated with DSOs because of the preponderance of them. And we find that one in five dentists under the age of 35 are affiliated uh, with DSOs. Let's start off the conversation, Scott. Uh, how long has been consolidation been going on in dentistry? And how do you see the next five to seven years for consolidation and activity? I've been practicing in the space for close to 20 years. Um, so my the majority of my career, I've been practicing in total for 25 years. So I've seen aggregation in this marketplace for the last 20 years. Um, <clears throat> and I think for the next five to seven years, you're going to continue to see aggregation. What's changed um, a lot is um, from, from whether I was seeing it from the buy side or sell side, you saw a lot of what I call onesie twosie transactions where uh, the DSO comes in and buys uh, there's a bunch of deals in a local market because usually when they splash into a market they want to expand their footprint so they'll try and buy up a number of practices. It used to be that process took longer because you're doing it deal by deal. Today you're seeing sellers uh, come together through either a joint effort or preforming their own DSO. Uh, and you see some accelerating in those marketplaces where groups are aware that someone wants to buy them. Uh, they respect each other. They have a relationship professionally and, and sometimes personally. So they come together to increase their multiple and get a better valuation out of their, their total transaction. I've seen a lot more of those over the last five to seven years than, than I ever saw in the past. Interesting. How about, uh, you know, we're talking about a potential or pending recession next year. Do you think that's going to have any impact on consolidation activity, Scott? It, it, it would be um, naive to think that it wouldn't have some sort of impact on consolidation efforts. But the one thing that the healthcare sector, whether it's podiatry or dental or, you know, general practices, medical, they Healthcare businesses tend to be somewhat recession proof. So the businesses themselves won't suffer uh, as you might see other industries and sectors suffer. Now, the ability to transact could definitely be impacted by access to banking, access to capital, those type of things could uh, slow the marketplace. But I don't see it having an impact itself on the businesses where they would become unattractive to acquire them. I know uh, reading a number of uh, white papers on on all the consolidation going on, some people indicate that, you know, there's going to be a tremendous percentage of practices that are going to be affiliated with DSOs. But one of the things I've always was curious about is the inventory of suitable practices for acquisition. I guess the old rule of thumb used to be about a million dollars or a little bit less. They would be a target, obviously larger too. But the fact that there's so many smaller practices out there and the fact that so many dentists are affiliated with DSOs, do you, do either of you feel there's any kind of a limit with the amount of inventory of larger practices for acquisition by whether it's a elite DSO or just an emerging DSO? I, I've always been curious about that. I was wondering what you, you gentlemen think. Yeah, Scott, yeah I think? mean, I think there's going to be, yeah, I think there's going to be an evolution of, of this exercise. You know, Scott alluded to the next five to seven years being fairly active and you know, I, if I backed up, I've been doing this for about 12 years now. So I've, I've watched a lot of that growth. Uh, what well, used to be teamed a management company, then became a DSO, then became a DPO, DMO. We, we call it a, little, a lot of different things, but a combined group. But if we look to our physician brethren that have been doing this for 30 to 40 years in consolidation, joining the hospital, leaving the hospital, you still see solo practitioners opening every single day. So, you know, as we look to this evolution, one of the things that the pending recession may do for us is allow us to have some of those solo practitioners or new pipeline um, grow and, and be, become available. You know, I was watching the, the news yesterday as far as the market liquidity, and there's still trillions, about two plus trillion dollars of liquidity available on the, you know, the capital markets today and just cash sitting on the sidelines. 
you know, a lot of these private equity groups are needing to deploy that. They need to make the return for their investors. They need to, um, you know, get that cash active. And what may change as we go into next year that the cost of funds is certainly going up. So the debt is rising. Uh, the debt cost is rising, if you will. So that component of the valuation may be shifted a little bit. They may come out of pocket a little bit more if they want to get deals done. But, you know, Scott and I've worked on a lot of deals together the last 24 months. And, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of new groups that have come to fruition the last 24 months. And again, they need to deploy capital. They need to grow for their investors. So those individuals are going to be looking at activity for 2023 and beyond. There may be some folks that say, you know, we wanted to get in this market. Let's hold out and see if the market softens a little bit or if this opportunity, um, you know, comes into the back half of next year. To your conversation about the, the practice, you know, the million dollar dental practice used to be the thing to do. Well, now it's one, two, one, five. It's, it's a little bit shifted. The growth of these individual practices has also grown. You know, you have general practitioners starting to bring in specialists or partnering with specialists or even taking those weekend courses and expanding even the treatment plans within the practice that allows them to expand the revenue per operatory that they tend to measure. But you still have a lot of practices, these six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar practices that aren't coming around or just aren't getting past that pump. And we talk to a lot of folks that that is their sweet spot. They know how to get them past that mark and beyond. So I think at every level that we look at, you know, we're going to see a different buyer for a different seller. And as we work through that piece together, nearing all that stuff up, that becomes a really big part of the conversation that we're, we're all having day to day. Great. Yeah. Just to add a little bit to that, Mike touched on a couple of really good points. It's probably helpful just for the audience to understand is yeah. the model that exists in the, in the healthcare sector in general. When I say model is when private equity starts investing uh, into a sector, it, it often and almost always uh, requires aggregation uh, and further consolidation into that sector. So they make an investment into a platform. Organic growth is not going to get them the returns that their investors are looking for, which are very rich returns. And that requires further investment of further dollars. Um, so it necessitates aggregation and acquisition and getting out your checkbook and writing and buying more practices. While there's a plethora of inventory, each of those PE buyers has a lot of optionality on what they want to pursue and what really fits within their quote discipline, um, what they like to see and what their parameters are. And those, those do exist as to, and sometimes they will stray from those, some, from those disciplines, but it gives them optionality. Um, when you have a large inventory, now as that inventory shrinks, um, it just becomes much more of a, of a seller's market to the extent those practices are attractive and, and are being sought to be bought. Right. So, and if we build, you know, I think as we go through that, I think it's almost going back to the overall valuation. A lot of folks hear about these 11, 12, you know, 14x valuation multiples. And I think it's really important to, you know, break that up and understand really what's happening. You know, a lot of that's so a twofold from the transaction standpoint. Somebody would pay a 12x multiple or 10x multiple, whatever it is. Well, if they buy at 10x and buy every other practice in the future at 10x, when they flip it for 10 or 11, 12x, there's not as much multiple creation or valuation creation. So what they're hoping to do is buy that initial platform for a 10, 11, 12x, and then buy everything else under that platform, average cost is six, seven, five x multiple. That brings over all their average costs down. So when they do flip at 11, 12 X, they've created this larger, um, you know, wealth creation, if you will, for everybody involved, some of those initial owners and some of the ones that came along with that as well. I think that's real important to delineate as I get that question so often of how are these people transacting with these high valuations? The other thing I think is important when you're looking at this, you know, and you're talking to your buddies and I hear this all the time at these conferences. Well, I got an 11 X. I got a 12 X. I think it's really important to understand what, what are you getting? The reality is it's somewhere between four and six X cash at close, somewhere around there, because most lenders are only going to go up to three and a half, four times cash on debt from a leverage position. And then the private equity group or your platform's got to decide how much capital they want to invest alongside that lender to get that deal across. The rest of that is either going to be bonus incentives, seller carryback or purported value of your rolled equity in time. 
So, you know, make sure as you're kind of breaking up what it is in comparison when you're doing an LOI, when you're going through this process, what truly is cash at close, equity rolled, and your potential. Um, and you're banking on, you know, the right partner to see you through all that that process. Yeah, and just to follow up on the, on the role of your equity piece, it's also important. It's often missed uh, as an issue is at what life cycle is the private equity group uh, in within the, the, the platform that they're invested in. So if, yeah, about every three to four years, PE will transact, which means think of it as fish in a pond, smaller fish, bigger fish, and so on. So the bigger fish eats the smaller fish. And they move on. So your private equity partner that you may invest with is not going to be there for the long haul. They're in and out within you know a short time period. And what that means is if you're taking rollover equity, it's important to understand where they are in that time period because like any type of investment, mm-hmm. it needs time to grow. It needs time to mature. So while you may have gotten 11 or 12, on the next capital event, you may not see much value at all because your dollars came in so late into the game, the equity that you receive as your lower equity is already priced at market price conditions. So you need additional time for that even in the, in the business itself to grow. Um, so it's, it's important to understand those um, caveats as well because that can be going in a lot of disappointment for someone who's expecting a second payday and it doesn't come to fruition because they didn't understand the market and how those numbers all match up and, and come together. Um, are there differences between like an owner's EBITDA versus that of a potential purchaser's EBITDA? Obviously, uh, well, I've done a lot of valuations, mostly on the private sales side, uh, and we use different methods than what what we do in the in DSO space. Uh, so there's always been talk about you know doctors getting their own value, EBITDA valuation, and then all of a sudden they get presented or potential acquisition by a DSO, and the DSO's totally different look on the EBITDA calculation. So just curious to can maybe talk a little bit about that. It's not yeah. like a universe. It, the words are the same, but how they get there is a lot different, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well, and there's so much to uncover in this conversation. And, and, and for everybody listening, you know, the, the goal here is a, a, a series of, of conversations. So we, you know, this is a constant reminder, you know, issue questions and stuff as we come down this and we'll make sure we address it on the series part two, three, four down the line. But, you know, let's start with what is EBITDA. You know, a lot of folks in this call may have heard of the word EBITDA, saw a conference, heard their friend talk about it, but by definition, it's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. All of that's to say is effectively when somebody is looking at purchasing you as an organization, they are trying to buy the free cash flow or free net earnings of the business that's left behind after doctors are compensated and all bills are paid. So when you look at this, the, the question Tom was saying, is there a different way to look at this? As a solo practitioner, the old adage was I sold my practice at 62 to 82 percent of trailing 12 collections, depending on market, but let's just utilize that for average. Well, that translates to about a two, two and a half times EBITDA multiple after paying the doctor's compensation to work at that practice. So when we look at these transactions today that are happening at, you know, seven, eight, nine times, that becomes a larger multiple of revenue for the actual transaction that's occurring. And the other side of unpacking this is what's fun is when you, you have your buddy saying, well, I got an 11X on sale, the buyer of that group that bought that 11X is saying, well, I bought it at 8.9 or I bought it at nine and a half and I got a real deal. So the perception of what even is valued at, you're going to have two different perceptions of how those numbers are run. And what that looks like. And it's very important to understand and get your financials in shape to where you understand and can tell the story about your business and understand practice by practice what your EBITDA is, what your corporate overhead is, understanding the financial fundamentals of the business. So when somebody else comes to, you know, beat up your numbers a little bit, as I will say, you are able to defend the ad backs, the adjustments, the one time expenses you know, the personal noise that's in that business, but, you know, understanding the net in earnings of the business from that standpoint. I'm sure Scott has something to add on that. No, I think you you covered it quite well. You were the better one. Than <laughs> the, the only comment I would say is it gives both parties the opportunity to think they won because of the different views on, yeah. on EBITDA. Um, so it does create a, an opportunistic market. 
How about uh, interest rates? You know, obviously they're going up. How far they go, no one knows. Uh, will that really have a big impact on EBITDA multiples? Will, do they get lower, higher interest rates, or is that just a, well, it's, a it's, small blip? It's definitely going to impact the amount of cash uh, that is available on the transaction. We may not see overall multiples impacted all that much, but it certainly will restrict the amount of cash that is going to be available based on your capability to leverage the existing EBITDA uh, and the EBITDA that you're acquiring. Okay, thanks. And, and, exactly. and kind of breaking that up a little bit more time, and the reason why is the cost of funds, and Scott touched on a little bit earlier, but, you know, if a lending institution is lending a DSO platform, what they were lending at 4%, 4.5% interest rate, and that's now 7 again, they have investors to answer to themselves, in, including themselves as investors and their doctor partners. And so if that cost of funds has gone from 4 to 7 or, or 4 and a half to 7 and a half, um, that ROI or the return on investment and that valuation, there's, there's a higher cost to run the business. So when they're looking at deploying more capital or getting that, you know, delayed draw and turn down loan debt um, to buy more practices, they have to really be mindful of the margin they're willing to pay, what the valuation is. And, you know, the cash at close may or may not change a little bit, but that rolled equity value may discount. They're going to find their lever to continue to hit the return on investment that they need to for their, you know, for their investors and, and partner docs. Okay. Well, thanks. So let's uh, talk a little bit uh some legal issues. Uh, Scott, I'm going to direct this to you. Uh, why is entity formation so critical at the outset for our emerging or new group practice uh, candidates? Well, uh, it, it's really, so one of the things that I guess that I can touch on as far as my background, but one of the things I specialize in is building structures from the ground up so that they're built for aggregation and growth. Um, and when we do that modeling, we typically start with the end goal mind, which can change, uh, which is important that you build flexibility in that structure to the extent that um, desires change. But you usually start the approach from a, from a back end. Where is, where is it you want to be in the next 10 years or 15 years? And what is the plan? Are you building this to keep it? Are you building it to sell it? Uh, or are you building it to do something else with it? And you kind of got to work through those questions because if you don't, you can find yourself in a structure that just doesn't match up with, with what your expectations might be on an exit. So it's important to get tax classification of your entities right, get your documents structured correctly. Uh, because if a buyer does come along and they see a structure that's sloppy or messy or done incorrectly, it is it immediately gives them a tint toward the fact that the practice may be ran in the same fashion that the documents weren't taken care of, is the practice fast and loose? Like, what is this? Now, is it going to kill the deal? Most likely not, but it certainly can impact valuation and price when you have potential buyers coming in to look at your documents and your structure. So it's important to have it done correctly. And there's not, you know, I don't want to say there's one DSO model that exists because there's different variations, but overall you're dealing with a set of regulatory rules as you go across the state. And there's only so many ways that you can approach uh, those regulations and how to be compliant with them. Um, so you've got compliance issues, and then also from a structural standpoint, the economic outcome that you're looking for, and does the structure that you have set up going to achieve that, or is it going to be set up for failure? Great, great. Um, yeah, and when, when we look at it, if I can say something real quick, Tom, as we look oh, at sure. the, the, the structure so often, you know, as we go through this process, you know, I get to meet a new client or a new somebody at you know, new practice and whatnot along the way. And, and not, okay, talk to me about your infrastructure. Where, do you have service agreements? Do you have, you know, entities? Do you have, are you in compliance along the way? And a lot of times, yeah, I have this DSO. Great. You know, my response is, let me see the financials. And the reality is majority of the time, the DSO that was formed wasn't implemented, right? So the accounting wasn't built there. There's not a checking account for that entity. There's not a, you know, service agreement that's being followed as the attorneys laid out and, and put that forth. And as Scott just touched on the compliance and the regulatory compliance of that DSO is so critical to have in place um, in order to, you know, manage this, stay in compliance if you bring a, a lay person in or a non-doctor in to that ownership pool, but also as outside folks are looking in, 
they're looking to see that not only is your paperwork in order, but your accounting reflects that paperwork. It tells the story. Um, and as we think about, you know, what the service agreements are for, what we're, we're offering, you know, getting those pieces in place as they make the investment. The other side that we also talk about on the, the emerging, you know, as we talked to so many folks on the call today, you know, we've measured inflection points over the years, one to three locations, three to 15, you know, 15 and up are, are all inflection points in the growth of your general group practice or DSO. And, you know, I don't think Scott and I will say you need a DSO day one, but you do need to know what your end goal is. If your end goal is to bring in private equity or your end goal is to have a partnership structure knowing at what point and having those conversations with your legal team, your accounting team, your, your advisors along the way. So we know when to implement that structure is so critical to the equation. Um, and a lot of times it gets in where we start running a regional manager through one location, HR through another, um, you know, doctors are all paid out of one entity that they aren't working at. I mean, it, it becomes an accounting mess that you're trying to wade through to help build the infrastructure from that standpoint as well. Great. I know the other week we, we were having a conversation just about the market. And I think, Scott, you mentioned you, you have seen more failures recently than maybe in the prior days. And it probably stands to reason because there's so many people in this space now. And unfortunately, some people not getting the expert advice that they need to do what they need to do correctly. Uh, for those of you, both of you have seen any failures, what were they usually attributed to? Just as in a general sense, just to give our audience some some food for yeah. thought. Well, this guy go first, and then I'll chime in as well. There, there's a number of it, it can be a number of different factors, but the primary one that I see is they become over leveraged, um, take on too much debt, uh, and walk a very tight line. And then if market conditions change, such as a COVID or another issue comes along. Uh, and the revenues dip, but now out of compliance with their loan covenants and have no way of getting back into them without a uh, serious amount of additional investment. Um, being over leveraged causes a number of other things to occur. Uh, the doctors become more stressed to being pushed harder to produce. Um, it can create tension between management and the actual practitioners who are, or the engines of the business. Uh, and will typically, if not solved, result in collapse. So, for me, the, the ones that I've seen and the ones I've been involved in, uh, where we've been on the buying side, coming in and buying distressed assets, um, it's really been related to, to over leverage. Yeah, and, and I will agree with what Scott's saying there. You know, we see over leverage, and, and some of that is, you know, we always have the old adage as entrepreneurs, as business owners ourselves, you, you're looking at building and investing in your business, and, you know, if you were making a set amount of money. And all of a sudden, you add three more locations. Well, naturally, you think, well, I'm going to make more money. But the reality is that you're investing so much more into the business. You've got to be prepared for that investment. And a lot of times, people think that the lender is going to make that investment for them. But the reality is that the lender wants you to invest alongside you in your process. So if you're not prepared for a market that didn't work out the way you thought, or you go chase a deal just because it looks like a good deal, you know, that becomes so apparent and so important to when you're dental group. And you know, we always talk about replicability, understanding what your model is, what's made you successful for the first location, doing it one more time to two locations, understanding what the systems are, what broke when your time stretched from one to two to understand that three locations, it may not seem like much, but time and time again, it's a major inflection point in your growth cycle. You can't be at three different practices in the same day. You can't Trust the office managers that just do the, their thing that they want to do. You're still bringing associates along with you. You bring in that bookkeeper. You outsource the accounting. The bank expects a little bit more out of you. Again, we see that at seven locations. But if some of these people try to go from two, three to seven overnight, they think they have the magic formula. And they haven't tested the systems enough. And now we get back to the over leverage. They have no room to run on the bandwidth of their system. They aren't collecting AR as well as they used to. They aren't you know, producing at the same level um, at each practice like they did before. Um, Sally Jane's coming over here wanting a raise. Otherwise, she's going to go across the street and work at another practice, but you don't have the relationship you used to. So culture becomes such an important, vital part of building that business brand. Um, you know, so everybody knows that you can replicate your model. And then we get back to the valuation conversation. 
that is where these valuations really, if they can throw cash in the steroids basically at a group and say, man, your systems are so dialed in that if we just put systems and better leadership around your team and growth, we can catapult this to another level. All you need is the right amount of capital partner. That's what's going to drive that replicability and provide you a little sanity uh, through the process. Don't try to build a 2 million practice here, a 7 million over here, specialty clinic down the street because we think we want to get into specialty. Understand what's making you successful and what your team is good at. And even Bill and Scott said earlier, if you're a Medicaid shop, be Medicaid. If you're a PPO, then that's you. You know, trying to be all things to all people is really going to struggle, um, you know, as you build out your model. You got to stick to your disciplines. I mean, reality is running a DSO and, and the ones that make the papers are the large groups. But Mike touched on it is there's yeah. a lot of small DSOs. But getting out and writing a check is easy. Anyone can buy assets yeah. if you have capital and there's access to it out there. But actually taking those assets and managing them and producing a profit is, is an often difficult task. And I see that with a lot of groups, like Mike said, that, that bump up real quick. They went from two to five to now they've got nine practices. And when you start to dial in and look at the numbers of those each of those locations, there might be one or two stars amongst the group, but the others are all failing. And then when you start to talk to the management team, you explore a little bit more. And, and the answer is, they haven't been to those locations. They're not spending the time. As I say, building a DSO is not going to, um, you may reduce your chair side time, but it's going to increase your management time substantially. Almost twofold of the amount of effort you were putting into your business before you became a DSO is what you, what you should expect to put into it as you're trying to grow. Uh, it's not going to be the other way, or you need to find people that are capable of running those offices and managing. Uh, and too often, Egos get in the way of accepting that they're not the right person for the job. Yeah. It, it's funny. I, I get to go to a lot of conferences and, and have these conversations. Scott, what you just touched on, I just still remember, is, you know, I was in Arizona. It was a solo practice. This guy worked one day a week, was making $2 million net profit a year. And then he went to a DSO conference thinking, I, I need to do this. I need to... And it was, what do you want to do when you grow up? Because you have a really good lifestyle right now. Is that really what you want? And having that conversation to say, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? Are you just doing this because everybody else is? Or do you enjoy the lifestyle you have? Um, you know, maybe before you just blow it all up, try to do too, because your net earnings will decrease for a little while for that second location until you build it back up and, you know, throw a third, fourth location. And I still, you know, those kind of conversations are so impactful on both sides, I, I think, um, to our, you know, what we got to experience and stuff. Um, well, one question came up with one of our, one of our reps the other day about uh, groups having a bunch of independent contractor specialists. And they were talking uh, to uh, a DSO that wanted to acquire them. And they ran into some problems because they wanted these doctors, if they were transferring over, to become W-2 employees. Is that a big deal? I mean, is it those kind of things important relative to how your part-time specialists are, are uh, compensated either as a contractor or as an employee? And, and will that affect a potential transaction in the future? Well, it, it, so, it, so yeah. you're talking about employee classification issues. Yeah. And yeah, those are sensitive topics that often come up in, in uh, transactions as part of the diligence process. And there's not a lot of gray in that area. It's pretty easy to figure out whether someone's improperly classified or not. There's lots of tax specialists um, that go through these processes all the time. Now, it may create tensions where someone's moving from a 1099 to a W-2 because it's going to impact their, their overall income. But the reality is... It, it is what it is, and you can try and structure as one or the other, but there's not a lot of flexibility depending on what the business arrangement is going to be. I don't know, Mike, if you've got other comments about it, but no, it, it, no it's, it, it's right. It, there's not much of a gray area here. I know there's a lot of practices over the years. I, I feel like I've seen a shift in my time in, in dental where we're, we're getting further and further away from the independent contractor. There are some reasons why you see them. Um, just viable reasons, and I get it, and, and those are the reasons at that time. But you know what we haven't touched on when these either calculations are happening or in diligence through a merger and acquisition process, 
what's typically done by the buyer is a quality of earnings um, report, which is basically testing and providing assurance what the EBITDA is. And one of the big adjustment discussions or tests that happens from the tax standpoint and, of course, legal is the properly classified independent contractor that should be an employee and what the financial impact to that conversion will be. Because a lot of these groups have already formulated how they're going to classify their employees. They're following all the regulatory rules. And you're going to adapt to that because they don't want anything you know, improper within their group coming up. Um, so you're going to see that happen as part of a QE adjustment if you're not already doing it properly. So, you know, that's something that you need to work with your individual CPA advisor and make sure all your employment contracts are, you know, again, this gets back to the regular the compliance. Make sure all your employment contracts are, you know, looking at that. Make sure your tax advisors have given you advice on which one, you know, falls into which bucket. Um, and, and make this time, here we are Q4, make this the time to make the conversion going into 2023. Great. Uh, you mentioned inflection points a couple times, uh, Mike, and yeah. I'm just curious, I, I've had this question asked of smaller groups, uh, an HR department, when is, when is it time to really make that investment uh, instead of having an office manager try to, to manage three <laughs> or four or five practices? When do you really make an investment to beef up that HR department, for example. Yeah. Well, in, in the great thing about, you know, the evolution of this industry that we've all seen is the ability to fractionalize so many of these functions today. I mean, including our team from accounting, but there's so many other folks that do that. HR, the same. There's several great platforms that do fractional HR until you're ready full time. What we always lay out is we want you to start thinking about your corporate entity and corporate employee org chart. So CEO, CFO, CTO, COO, and start putting a name next to that. And you're going to see early on your one to three locations, you're going to have a lot of your name all over that. But as you start seeing certain inflection points with employee counts and certain things that you're not as good at as you may be, or your HR, your office manager doesn't have as much experience, those are things that you need to say, great, I need this HR company to take over this function, make sure I'm in compliance, make sure all my W-4s, I-9s, all, all those things are happening. The sexual harassment, you know, you know, uh, education forms, uh, you know, HIPAA compliance, stuff, all those things are happening within my organization. Same thing with IT, you know, at what point do you need an inflection point? So, for HR, we're, we're typically saying, okay, at 50 to 75 locations, there's a, there's a, you know, a risk of compliance thing that you need to start thinking about getting a legitimate fractional HR. You may not need somebody full time. Uh, we typically see that around 20 to 25 million in revenue or about 20 locations, um, for that. We see, you know, as we think about the inflection, we see the first accountant internally coming in around 10 to 15 locations, that CFO coming in around 35 million in revenue. Um, you know, what I would, uh, I would hesitate or tell everybody to be hesitant. And I know Scott's going to know this is don't over title somebody day one. If you're bringing somebody in and they're going to run your operations team, they don't need to be COO day one. If you're a three location group, because the question is, is that the COO at 15, 20, 30 locations? Have they ever run an organization that big? Same with HR, same with controller, same with CFO. I see this so often where we put somebody in a position to run an apartment or function, and yet they've never run anything bigger than they are. You want that person to be able to bring you to that next level um, in the growth of your life cycle and help you get there as well. You got anything you know, to add to that? Yeah. I, the one thing I would add is I don't know that I've outside of um, founders uh, who may not even maintain their position. I rarely see a DSO start and finish with the same team. You will go through different iterations of growth where someone's not capable of running a 30 location operation for whatever role that they're playing. They're used to a much smaller organization and they don't want to do it. So they move on and you have to find new people or they try and they fail and you then still have to replace them. So you see a lot of turnover uh, in these growth models as growth occurs. And aggregation occurs. So the team you start with is is most likely not going to be the team eventually. Yeah. Uh, and kind of closing it out, there was a question that came up uh, the other day about how the market's adjusting for Band-Aid DSOs and those being accepted 
where a group of independent practices are coming together, go to market together. You know, you're talking a bit about uh, the Band-Aid DSO issue. Either of you. Yeah, so well, we, we both you know, we just finished one together. So go ahead, Scott. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they they are real um, and, and they do exist and the market does recognize them. They're getting better multiples in the marketplace by agreeing to transact uh, on a collective basis as opposed to being represented one after one after one. So you're knocking down dominoes or you can take them all in one fell swoop. And the reason primarily that P's willing to pay more for that is there's less costs involved all the way around and they can actually in one fell swoop, pick up a number or group of assets. So it's attractive for them. They can come into a marketplace and they grab that marketplace. There's less risk in, hey, we buy one practice and then we're competing with other DSOs or trying to buy in that marketplace where if you're buying a group or collection of PCs in a, in a certain city or market, um, it can be very attractive for them and they're, they're willing to pay higher multiples for that. Is it the same as what you would get for a true DSO? Unlikely, because a true DSO I think it's important to understand what is a DSO. It's not just the idea of I have a couple of medical or dental practices and I want to convert to a DSO model. That that's somehow going to magically change the the value of what you would expect to transact. It's the actual DSO and the building of that administrative team and the synergies created by a collection of assets and having a scalable. As Mike was talking about, down in systems and down in team members that understand the business, understand the KPI, understand the markets they're in. There's value in that because PE doesn't have to come in and invest in those in those assets to build out that that management feature and the, and the platform, and they can instead use their dollars on acquisition. And then you just plop them in and, and go with it from there. So a true DSO is is a true management group. Um, it's just not it's not just a collection of practices. Uh, and while you can get a higher multiple for a collection of practices. It's not going to be as high as what you would see for an actual well-run DSO. No, it's got absolutely right. You know what we're seeing in, in these; they are happening more and more. I think we're we're working on half a dozen of them right now, where you're starting to see this collective of practices, friends, whether it be GP and specialty, come together. A cool GP. Everything Scott just said is great. If they're taking a re- regional territory, they're taking a couple of regional territories. And they know they can build off of that. And they have a stack of pipeline acquisitions right after that um, of their friends that say, yeah, we want to be a part of it, but we want to see you do it first. And you get a little bit of that. You know, the big thing that these groups are looking for is some symbolicness of a coming together of, I'd say, the major functions, finance and accounting, uh, a bit of ITHR and some analytics stuff. And, and all of those things really help in driving that function forward and then a roadmap of what is post 90 days at, you know, you know, the integration look like who's going to be the CEO, who's going to be the CFO, who's going to be the COO of that structure. And then what's the pipeline beyond the first tranche, right? Are we acquisition model? Are we a de novo model? You know, again, get back to that replicability conversation. We still have to tell a story post, you know, that if they're going to pay a premium on the initial acquisition, how are they going to get their buy down and how are you going to get more practices and more EBITDA within that? In addition, they want to see organic growth, a history of it. We have enough time post COVID nowadays. There was a lot pre COVID of these groups growing super fast where they were just aggregating EBITDA. And this is on a traditional buy, traditional acquisition. And they, after a while, they realized the core practices they're acquiring, there wasn't a whole lot of organic growth. So, Showing your organic growth, showing your post-COVID world and how you, you know, how you're resilient to these things that happen. We started this conversation about assistance and hygienists almost vanishing was what it feels like in so many markets. How are, how are we to find our resiliency of getting through that from that standpoint? But yeah, we're going to see more of these practices coming together, more friends coming together. And I, I think the market's, you know, reacting to it appropriately. I think we covered a lot of ground tonight and, uh, I want to thank you both for the, uh, your expertise. As uh, Mike referenced, we're hoping that, uh, that we'll be able to present uh, several more of these webinars in 2023 and actually form a series because I'm sure not all your questions were answered tonight. That's understandable. Uh, but we'd like to encourage you to submit any questions, and I'm going to put up in a second uh, some information where you can contact us 
And uh, we'll use that as a building block for uh, more programs in 2023. If you'd like to reach out to us, uh, here's contact information, and uh, we'll make sure that any information that we get relative to any questions for either Scott or Mike, we'll pass on to them, uh, as well as use it for future uh, content building, because I'm sure there are lots of questions that you folks have. And hopefully, we, even though we only scratched the surface, uh, we've given some of you some better insights and hopefully some motivation to, to do things the right way, as these gentlemen have, have actually uh, told you to do. So, again, I want to thank you all for uh, joining. And if Mike or Scott want to say something in closing, the floor is yours. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate everybody's time and energy to listen to us today. And, you know, as Tom mentioned, if there's any other follow-up questions or anything we can build on, we covered a lot of big topics at a very high level. So, you know, if there's certain focal points you want us to dig into further, let us know. We're looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I uh, echo Mike's, Mike's sentiments. I uh, look forward to continuing the series and, and sharing uh, our knowledge base with all of you. Thank you again. And with the, the uh, holidays around the corner, I wish everyone a happy holidays and a happy new year. And we'll see you uh, in 2023. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We did record tonight's webinar and we'll email out the recording sometime in the next week. We would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars.